so you had your your own uh, homebrew store, working yep. a second job, yep. a kid. Yep. And then at, at what point did you then think, what I really need to do to make things even easier for myself is to start, <laughs> is to start a brewery. Martin's drinking by himself. Yeah, it's, it, that happens all the time, so it's fine. 20 years ago, I tasted a beer that completely changed my life. That beer was Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Ken Grossman was the visionary founder of a brewery which was instrumental in the formation and revolution of craft beer around the world. To this day, I have lived by the mantra, when I grow up, I want to be Ken Grossman. Cheers. Cheers. So from the age of 13 to 17 in the UK, I drank Tenant's Lager, and I thought that's what beer was. Then in, when I was 17 years old, there was two beers that changed my life forever. One was Cantillon Rose de Gambrinas, mm -hmm. and the other one was Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. And where were you drinking that, in the UK or over when you'd visit the US? It was in the, in the UK. In the UK? I'd only ever been to the US uh, once by the time I was 17. And I was 10 the first time I was here. And I think if my parents had allowed me to have a beer when I was 10, I would have, well, they would have been locked up. I would have been fine. <laughs> It's an absolute privilege to be here today in, uh, in the brewery here in Chico. I would like to start with just understanding a little bit about uh, how you came into beer in the first place. Actually, uh, it was when I was quite young and, and uh, I, I guess my parents could have been locked up as well if they, uh, if they were aware of what I was doing. But, um, so I had a, a neighbor who lived uh, just a few doors down and his son and I went to elementary school together. And so from a pretty early age, I'd go visit my buddy and his dad was always doing something uh, with fermentation. So he was a serious home brewer uh, and back in that era. So that was back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, home brewing was really not um, something that was very common or popular and certainly not um, quality focused. Yeah. So the, the home brewers were trying to make maybe a cheap batch of beer, high alcohol, lots of sugar. Um, and not necessarily um, were they perfecting the art of brewing, but but this guy uh, Cal was his name. He was a, a serious amateur brewer and winemaker, uh, distiller. He was into everything fermentation. Even made sake. I remember when I was a kid, uh -huh. and so I was exposed to boiling wort and fermenting beer from a really early age. And I guess uh, just the whole romance of of the alchemy of of brewing got into my system, and so. When I was a teenager, I started to uh, play around a little bit and brewed a little bit of beer in my closet and then mm -hmm. uh, hit it later in a little uh, building I had in back and, and actually started um, brewing around 1969. 1969. And, yeah. And, um, and back then, you know, the, the brewing information came out of the UK. So the, the books that I read were, um, um, you know, British brewing books and about how to make British style beers. and. Um, then uh, a, a treatise of lager brewing came out by Fred Eckhart, and I read that, and then started really to expand my my brewing hobby. I moved to Chico in 1972 and took my home brewing kit with me. And uh, within a couple of years, I decided uh, I wanted to be more serious about it. I was studying chemistry in college, so I had a, a science background. Okay. And I opened up a homebrew supply store in 1976, and uh, that allowed me to really perfect my brewing and import a lot of great ingredients. And so I was bringing malts and hops from Europe over and going up to Yakima. I did that my, my very first year of the homebrew shop. Okay. Uh, made a pilgrimage and bought all the different varieties of American hops I could get. And then after homebrew shop for a couple of years, I said, I, I think I want to be a commercial brewery. And New Albion had opened up in um, uh, Sonoma. And I went down and visited Jack McAuliffe and visited Fritz Maytag in San Francisco. Um, so that was all in the mid 70s. and then. Put my homebrew shop up for sale, wrote a business plan in 1977, 1978, we incorporated. So, um, started started brewing beer commercially in uh, 1980. And and what was the beer scene like back when you uh, when you were homebrewing and when you had the, the homebrew, homebrew store before you started the brewery? You know, the beer scene in America was pretty dismal. The, um, the, the range of beers really, if you wanted to sample uh, a range of beers, they came from Europe. There were you know, basically one style of beer being brewed by just about all the breweries, and that was American Light Lager. Mm -hmm. There were a couple exceptions, but uh, 
Rainier Ale uh, up out of uh, uh, Seattle. Rainier uh, Ale was probably an anomaly. Uh, high alcohol, it was really a malt liquor, I think, more than a, than a real a tough fermented ale. Uh, but it had a little bit of character and flavor. And then Valentine's India Pale Ale was around uh, back. Uh, very limited distribution. But mm -hmm. besides that, it was really 95% light lager beers. Um, so the scene was pretty dismal if you wanted to, to, to be a beer drinker, unless you went and just bought a range of imported beers. And were there any beers that influenced you in those early days? You know, certainly, uh, you know, what Fritz Maytag had done at Anchor Steam and, and what Jack McAuliffe had done. But a, as a serious home brewer myself, I was brewing just a whole range of beers. And, and we were serious enough that we had our own yeast collection. So we had a, we had a variety of, of yeast in our, uh, in our own collection. And I was able to, say, bring in a lot of imported ingredients. So I was bringing in malt and hops from Europe. And so I brewed pretty much everything. Um, matter of fact, the, the first batch of beer that we brewed uh, um, when I opened the brewery in 1980 was a stout, and I had been brewing stouts at home for many, many years, and, um, and strong ales and um, IPA styles. Actually, one of our early recipes that we didn't go with, we actually called an IPA, and, and it was uh, uh, ended up being more like our celebration ale, which came out with an 81. Uh, but it was very, very limited, and um, you know, homebrewing was illegal uh, at at that point in time. Uh, didn't become legal for a few years after that, huh. Al although nobody was ever arrested for it. Um, after prohibition, home winemaking got legalized, but for some reason, home brewing sort of uh, was never addressed. Back then, in the late seventies, was that a viable business to have a homebrew store in uh, in Chico? No, um, I, uh, I actually had to work a second job. Um, so my wife and I, I had a, a partner for a little bit when I first opened the shop, was a neighbor of mine. Mm -hmm. And then he decided it wasn't for him. And so I bought him out and then my wife and I ran the shop and I had a second job. So I, I worked in a bicycle repair shop um, as a mechanic uh, most of the, the week and uh, to, to pay the bills. And then my wife was was in the homebrew shop and then we had a baby and uh, okay. my daughter Sierra was born and so she was actually in a bassinet in the homebrew shop for uh, the first uh, six months of her life as, as we were uh, trying to make ends meet. But no, it was not a viable business. I mean, a, a good day was $50 and that was retail sales, that wasn't profit. Yeah. So, and how I mean, old were you at that, at that point? Uh, 22. 22, yeah. so you had your, your own uh, homebrew store, working yeah. a second job, yeah. a kid. Yep. And then at, at what point did you then think what I really need to do to make things even easier for myself is to start, <laughs> is to start a brewery? I, I seriously debated, do I go with a bike shop where I know I can make a living or do I open a brewery where I know I'll be challenged and uh, it'll be something that I'm a lot more passionate about. And so I consciously passed on the bike shop and decided to go all in on the brewery, um, hoping that uh, you know it would be uh, something I could make a living at eventually, and, and our, our business plan was quite meager. Um, it called for us uh, being able to brew 2,500 barrels of beer a year uh, mm -hmm. in, in a 10 barrel brew house that I built myself. Um, and then if possible, mm -hmm. if there was a market for it, we could expand to 3,500 barrels a year. Yeah, so you've got a business plan that says you can, if you make that much beer, it, 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 it makes sense. Yeah. But that's a business plan and, and not reality. Correct. So, so how, how did... Uh... Reality was harsh. <laughs> um, the, the business plan, besides the fact that we spent all the money we uh, had raised uh, numerous times and had to go back and go find more people to give us money. We ran out of money repeatedly before we got the doors open. So we, we were struggling even just to make our first batch of beer. It uh, took a long time to, to build all the equipment, so I welded it, I did all the plumbing myself, I did all the electrical myself, I did the refrigeration. So just getting the doors open was, was a challenge, and then as soon as we started making beer, we realized that there's a lot more expenses than we had anticipated, and so we, we pretty quickly decided we, we better expand or we're going to die. And uh, the breweries at that time, there were six of us that opened up between 1978 and 1982. We're the last man standing as far as that original uh, group of six brewers.